Hi. My talk is called In Praise of the Slow Learner or In Praise of Slow Learning. One of the books that I just about remember reading in, in early youth was an illustrated edition of Aesop's Fables. And actually, I can only now remember one of the fables. I'm sure it's one you all know. The Tortoise and the Hare. You know that one? And um, I think we all recognise the moral justice of the uh, methodical tortoise's triumph over the quick yet complacent hare. And yet it seems to me that it's the hare's tactics that are generally prized by the English education system. At least that's been my experience of it, both as a, a student in schools and universities and as a teacher in schools and universities. From the parent who secretly gloats over their offspring's ability to walk or talk or say the alphabet a month or two before their peers, to the still extant 11 plus exam which separates the barely germinated wheat from the chaff, to the instant repartee that so often seems to win the day in the Oxbridge interview, our education system seems to privilege speed. The word quick, we remember, is synonymous with intelligent. But how horribly unjust to see as second rate those who may develop exactly the same qualities of mind just a little later. So I want to take up the cause of the slow learner and I want to argue that taking one's time, not getting it straight away, might be conducive to a, a deeper, longer lasting kind of learning. There's an interesting case um, related to all of this a few years ago of Sir John Gurdon, a British scientist who won the Nobel Prize for his groundbreaking research on cell development. And at the time that the prize was conferred on him, Gurdon told reporters that um, when he was at school, his ambitions to be a scientist had been brutally shot down by one of his teachers at Eton, who'd written in his report, uh, the report was published in some of the newspapers, that Gurdon's ideas of becoming a scientist are quite ridiculous. He wrote this in a report. I mean, that strikes me as a, a heinous betrayal of the teacher's duty to cultivate rather than crush ambition and potential. But what strikes me as especially sad about that case is that Gurdon was, and probably still is, the exception rather than the rule. That report stuck with him and probably spurred him on to, to try and prove that pompous schoolmaster wrong. But I'd say that the great majority of people who are written off at an early age don't necessarily bounce back from it. I worked for a number of years in adult education and many of the students I encountered had had bad experiences for one reason or another in school. Um, experiences which had sapped their confidence, which had um, ultimately driven them out of education early into unsatisfying and, and probably badly paid jobs. It had taken them years to, to muster the confidence to sign up for a distance learning course. And to this day, I, I have a deep respect for the way those students I, I taught at the Open University plunged themselves into their studies with such gusto as if trying to make up for lost time. Adult education, I think, is utterly vital to society because it gives those who've been too hastily discarded by education a second chance. And the sharp decline of part-time mature students, I think, is, is one of the most deplorable, if least noticed, consequences of recent education policy. But just going back to um, John Gurdon, I do have some sympathy with that teacher of his, because like all teachers, he was in the invidious business of having to measure learners' progress. And I tend to agree with the, um, the education blogger James Pembroke, who talks about the progress myth. And he says, progress is an individual thing, occurring at different rates and dependent on numerous influencing factors, yet we pretend it isn't so we can continue to produce numbers for those that demand them, never really questioning their validity. Another educationist, John Hattie, makes the point that intelligence is changeable rather than fixed. 
I like that. that. That resonates with me. I can remember points in my school career where I, I thought to myself that somehow I was less clever than I used to be, that I'd, I'd gone slightly backwards rather than forwards. And I suppose, if I'm honest, I think those, those feelings probably persisted into my late 20s. Progress is a myth, I think, because it implies an onward and upward trajectory, when in fact the true course is much, much bumpier than that. And I'm the more convinced of that. Every time I read the, the disarming sentences at the outset of Michel de Montaigne's great essay on the education of children, an essay that I think every contemporary thinker and writer and blogger about education ought to read. And at the beginning of his essay, Montaigne says this, he's talking about his own intellectual faculties. He says, my ideas and my judgment merely grope their way forward, faltering, tripping and stumbling. And when I've advanced as far as I can, I'm still not at all satisfied. This is Montaigne. This is one of the finest minds of the European Renaissance. Yet his is a mind which nevertheless knows itself to be only faltering forward, and by implication sometimes backwards too. Okay, so In Praise of Slow Learning was my title, and I want to pursue that theme a little by talking about the branch of learning in which I have a professional interest, which is the study of literature. <coughs> because literature, I think, is peculiarly resistant to the desire for instant gratification, and is thus hospitable to slow learning. Works of literature don't yield up their meanings easily. You have to live with a work of literature. And I think the very greatest works of literature have to be lived with for a whole lifetime. I'll never forget something the inspirational teacher who taught us Hamlet in the sixth form said about that play. He said that when he'd first encountered the play as a young man, um, he found the character of Hamlet to be the touchstone of the play, the character that he'd most engaged with. But that uh, as he'd come back to the play in later life, he'd grown impatient with those speeches of Hamlet in which he rails against the deviance of his mother's sex life. And he had increasingly found the character of Claudius to be, if not sympathetic exactly, then the play's moral centre of gravity. Now that seemed to me a very good thing for an English teacher to impart. That sense that time could transform the meaning of a text. And it seems to me of a piece with one of the central contentions of David Holbrook's seminal 1961 book on English teaching in secondary schools, a book called English for Maturity, where Holbrook says that the proof of an English lesson or of an English course throughout an entire school is not in the number of A plus or A star marks, but intangibly in the capacities for living of our pupils. You can't hope to know a work of literature from a superficial acquaintance, just as you can't hope to know a person from a superficial acquaintance. You have to spend time with both. And that's one of the ways in which literature teaches us to live, enhances our capacities for living. You hear people speak about speed reading. People actually go on courses to learn how to speed read. But actually, it's not a skill to be sought after, certainly not with literature. In literature, the, the true skill is slowing reading down, I think. And it's for that reason that um, the genre of literature, the kind of literature that I felt most drawn to is poetry. Poetry is unique among the literary arts in that it has the pauses that slow reading down, built into its very fabric, its very texture. Lines of poetry seem almost stubbornly short sometimes. They refuse to kind of reach across to the far right of the margin. And that sort of makes the act of reading shudder. The reader's brought up again and again against this expanse of white page that surrounds the poem that is a sort of space for silent contemplation. That interval of time that it takes the reader's eye to, to travel from the end of one line of poetry down to another, 
is, as poets know, as poets know, time enough for numerous neurons to shoot across the brain, triggering new thoughts, making lateral connections. I've said that literature enhances readers' capacities for living. It does so because it witnesses to the writer's own capacities for, for living and for learning. And the lives of the writers who have been particularly exemplary for me have been the slow burners, the people who've taken their time. I think of Edward Thomas, who didn't write poetry until the age of 36, who couldn't write poetry until the age of 36, and then wrote all the poetry that he had to write in just two years before he was killed on, on the battlefields of Arras. I think of the American poet, Amy Clampett, who began even later at the age of 51. What a strange thing to do at that age, to start writing poetry. I think of Etra Pound, who in the Cantos, the poem that was his life's work, movingly cites Lawrence Binion's dictum, slowness is beauty. Slowness is beauty. And I think of Hemingway. I think of Hemingway's warning about writers who make it too early, who get a taste for early success, who get used to a bit of money. And he says they're caught when this happens. Writers have to write to keep up their establishments and so on. And they write slop. It's not slop on purpose, but because it's hurried. Because because they write when there's nothing to say, when there's no water in the well, because they're ambitious. Work that lasts, work of lasting quality then, comes about by waiting, waiting for the well to fill, waiting till you've got something to say. And actually, the, I think those words of Hemingway's stand as a rebuke, a rebuke to all the unthinking careerists and greasy pole climbers in every walk of life. I want to finish by very briefly considering another writer who offers us a, a more sceptical take on this idea of slow learning, a take which I think has to qualify my praise for it. I'm thinking of Wordsworth. Now, I do think of Wordsworth as a, a poet supremely interested in slow learning and related terms. He, um, gave his long autobiographical poem, The Prelude, the subtitle, Growth of a Poet's Mind. Wordsworth was on to growth mindsets long before Carol Dweck got hold of the term. But he also very much distrusts the notion that a great work of literature can come about just by waiting. Okay. He um, thinks it's, it's a little dangerous for the writer to put his faith in the wisdom reserved for age that will eventually come to him. He talks about taking refuge and beguiling myself with trust. He's talking about this as a kind of a self-deception of the writer. Beguiling myself with trust that mellower years will bring a writer m riper mind and clearer insight. Thinking things that will just sort of fall into place as you grow older is worth worth saying a convenient pretext for procrastinating, for postponing the attempt to write. He seems to me unlike Hemingway. Hemingway talks about writers sh not wa should waiting, should wait for the well to fill. Um, unlike Hemingway as well, I think R Wordsworth thinks that writers should be ambitious. Just a few lines after this, he talks about just ambition. But what brings justice to Wordsworth's sense of ambition? And what I, I want to conclude by proposing ought to condition everyone's sense of ambition is that intelligence is changeable, is the recognition that learning is a lifelong process and that life itself is a long and winding road. I shall leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.